Hello, and welcome to Provider Resilience, the pandemic version. We're very glad to be with you today. My name is Bobby Beal. I'm a clinical psychologist with some expertise in trauma, trauma-informed care, and resiliency. I'm with the Center for Innovative Practices at Case Western Reserve University. The center is Ohio's Center of Excellence for Child, Youth, and Family Behavioral Health Care. I have a colleague with me today, and her name is Marsha Miller, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, Marsha. Hi, Bobby. So good to be here with you and with all of you here who are, who are watching this. I'm a lifelong yoga teacher, yoga therapist. One of my specialties is using yoga practices to deal with those who have experienced trauma, and we love teaching this workshop together. Indeed, we do, and we've had quite a few opportunities. So today, this workshop is going to be jam-packed with information about what's going on in our world and how we're relating to it and what we need to keep an eye on. Um, this is the first of a four-part series, and today we'll be reviewing trauma-informed care and um, why everything's going on right now, why it's having such an impact on us. So we will work our way through other sections, but you won't get... Um, all the, all the information about your secondary traumatic stress as workers out there in the field and some of our best activities will be coming in future sessions. So hang in there with us and we hope to see you in all of the sessions one through four. But let's start with a little housekeeping. So as your trainers, we want you to stay safe and comfortable as we work through some really heavy material. Um, so here are some safety guidelines for you. First of all, you're a grown up and you should take care of yourself. Uh, we're not gonna um, say it's time to, you know, take a break or run and take care of yourself because these are gonna be 90 minute sections. And so you should really do a good job of paying attention to your body and how you're feeling as we work through some of this material. And some of the things that you can do to support yourself include hydrating. You should have handy, as I do, a bottle of water. Got one, Marsha? Oh, okay, you got yours in a mug, but yes. Excellent. And um, I, I can't underestimate the benefits of hydrating. And uh, so have some water handy. And we should take deep breaths. It turns out the research says that with many of us spending a lot of time on Zoom or any kind of online platform, we are not breathing very deeply. We end up leaning in, and breathing more and more shallow. And um, that makes our body tense up. And what we really wanna do is take in nice deep breaths, big belly breaths, if you will, not up here in your chest or your throat, but down in your belly and long, slow exhales. That very thing, just a deep breath and a long exhale triggers your parasympathetic nervous system to relax, to be calm. And so if you feel yourself being tense in any way, sit back, take a nice deep breath and continue along. You are obviously welcome to take a bio break. We'll never know. And of course you have the benefit now uh, since this is a recorded session of hitting pause and rejoining us. And um, we also encourage you, no matter what you're doing, um, if you're on Zoom, turn off your self view, not the view of us, we think, you should be looking at us while we're talking to you and giving you all this great information. But um, when you're on those online platforms, if at all possible, turn off your own self view so you're not looking at yourself the whole time. Because isn't that weird? You don't go to a meeting and set up a mirror in front of yourself while you're with all your colleagues. So we would like to avoid that. So other safety guidelines, because this is a trauma training, uh, include a content warning. We're going to talk about things that traumatize people, and uh, it's super likely that they are things that could potentially traumatize people who are watching this video. So just be aware that these are difficult topics, and again, you have the option to hit pause and think about um, what's going on and when you feel comfortable enough to be watching all of this. Um, you will absolutely uh, be a passive participant because uh, this is a recording and not live. Sometimes um, we may even make a mistake and say, hey, <laughs> throw it into the chat or click something on the screen because we're so used to doing this together in live versions. But 
Um, we hope that you will gain a lot of value and understanding from what we have here. And if you're seeing this, know that um, we have handouts and things that support the activities that we are going through. So you can also ask questions. And although you can't ask them live of us, uh, my contact information is all over the materials and definitely at the end of this program. And you are welcome to email us with any questions that you might have. And I think that's it for now, Marsha. Um, I'd like to turn it over to you at this point to start us with some grounding exercises. Yes, thanks, Bobby. It's very important because of what Bobby said, the content warnings and that you see this in your day and you hear about this and perhaps some of you have experienced this in your own life. So we wanna start from a place of grounding and for you to know that any of the things that I'm gonna show you right now are also things that you can add in whether we're talking about them or not. So if you find yourself suddenly feeling anxious in the middle of Bobby or myself talking later in this program or feel like suddenly you can't pay attention, which is one of the ways that we experience being triggered by materials. Like we sort of leave, uh, leave the space in one way or another, um, join in with, and anytime you can do any of these things that I'm gonna suggest now. So the first thing is to put your feet on the floor. And as you put your feet on the floor, now it might be that your feet are inside shoes or even slippers, but how, whatever your feet are in, put your shoes or your bare feet on the floor and just feel that contact. And as you do that, touch the tops of your thighs and feel that contact. And as you press down on the thighs, you'll feel a little more weight in the feet. And this is part of your body and your nervous system recognizing, I'm here, I'm right here. And whatever my system was remembering, I'm here and likely okay. You might experience uh, scrunching your feet up like this inside your shoes or bare feet on the floor and then spread them out. Try this with me. And this is where, you know, we want you to try these things, even if it seems unusual or weird, probably in your training, um, nobody ever showed you this. But now we know that feeling your body when you're stressed is really important. So now pause a second and just notice whatever you feel in your feet, your hands, your legs. And what I'm noticing is a sense of groundedness, as Bobby said, also a sense of aliveness that feels actually pretty good. Who knew my feet could feel this good? <clears throat> Another thing you can do, um, in addition to the breathing that Bobby recommended, is if you have essential oils or something that smells good, enliven your senses. You might even remember something that smells good. Anything you can do that brings you into your senses is going to be helpful. So I just, I just um, took a smell of grapefruit and that felt delicious and delightful. I also have a rock here and you could put something heavy in your hands or you could even lay it lay them on your legs and just feel like, okay, this sense of heaviness, the sense of this rock that I'm holding, which I remember where it came from. I was on vacation when I got it. So now I have a memory associated with it. It was peaceful. The heaviness is really good. Then there's one more thing that I'm gonna recommend and we'll do together. And that's something called tapping. And this is another way of calming our nervous systems. And I think you'll find by doing this and these other things that I've been talking about, you'll be actually ready to learn and get this incredible material that Bobby and I are gonna give you today. So you might just tap across your collarbones. This is also something that feels quite good to most of us. You could be a little bit under, a little bit above. You could just do it exactly in any way that feels interesting to you. You could come down the collarbone, I mean the um, breastbone a little bit. You could tap along your jaw. Oftentimes when we get agitated, our jaws are very tight and the tongue presses up against the roof of the mouth. So let your tongue hang down into your mouth and just be like oh, almost, not quite drooling, but almost. I always think of Homer Simpson on the Simpsons. And then maybe up around the um, sides of your head and across your forehead. 
And then pause a moment, feel that again, for me, a sense of aliveness. Bobby, what are you noticing? Like a tingling in, in my hands too. Yes. Because they're active. Yes. And then one more location. And to me, I don't know why this works. I don't really, I don't know that anybody knows why it works, but we know that it does work. And I'm tapping right along the side of the baby finger side of my hand. And I have had the experience of being in a room with a bunch of people talking about trauma, getting agitated myself. And the teacher was teaching this part. And I tapped on the side of my hand and I went from feeling completely agitated to totally calm in one moment, which was amazing and also very cool. So this is something simple. Try this yourself. And you, this is something simple you could teach your clients too, once you've had the experience personally that it helps. Then lower your hand down and now your hands are probably, as Bobby said, tingly, maybe even a little glowy. Feel your feet on the floor. And I feel like I'm just aware of the temperature of my hands. Oh yeah, good. The other thing too we wanna to invite you to, especially since you're watching, you know, at your own convenience is, if, if it helps you to get up and walk around while we're talking, we do want you to be able to see the screen, but you don't have to just sit here. You could also stand up and watch. And for some of us, that's really important. So back over to you, Bobby. Hope you all are feeling great as we move on to this next segment. Thanks, Marcia. All right, back to sharing. And we'll move on. So, tick or trauma-informed care is the new CPR. What do we mean by that? Well, our, my personal meaning is that everybody should know about it. We were, uh, you know, very active in the United States uh, in the 80s and 90s uh, through now to make sure that all sorts of people everywhere got trained in life-saving measures, including CPR. And um, because we felt like everyone should be able to help other people when there's a crisis. And being aware of how many people have experienced some sort of trauma, especially now with the pandemic, we think everyone should be aware of trauma-informed care. There are very specific things that we can be aware of and ways that we can respond to it um, that can be helpful instead of uh, re-triggering people or adding to the stress and trauma. So that's why we use this phrase, tick is the new CPR. We should all understand trauma-informed care and be prepared to respond appropriately. So let's dive in. First of all, the brain matters. For each of us, our brain's functioning is a reflection of our cumulative experiences. When a person is in a calm or a mild state of arousal, which I would hope you're in right now, you're either totally calm or mildly aroused because you're attentive, you're alert. And that means your cerebral cortex, the part up on the top there, is in control. You can access that part of your brain for a lot of thinking activities. All learning takes place in the cerebral cortex, all learning. Okay, if we have kids in school, they've got to be able to get into their cerebral cortex. If you're working with clients, they've got to be calm enough to be able to access the cerebral cortex. That's where learning and thinking and processing and reflecting all takes place. The problem is that trauma disrupts the development and the wiring, if you would, to the cerebral cortex and it limits our access to the cerebral cortex when we experience a lot of trauma or ongoing traumatic stress. So I just wanna give a tip of the hat to Dr. Bruce Perry, um, and we'll see some of his ideas and materials as we flow through here, but he said no single theory about the brain can capture the amazing complexity of human beings. The brain is understandable, and has exportable concepts, meaning we can understand it and we can use what we understand um, in our work with other people. This knowledge about the brain should complement your current perspective, not replace it. Nothing I'm saying here should be like, um, 
oh, that eliminates this other thought I had about the brain. It should just increase your knowledge. Dr. Perry uses a neurodevelopmental perspective, understanding that our brain grows throughout our lifetime, but clearly understanding that the biggest developmental growth is from birth to four or five years old. And your brain is not fully developed until honestly our thirties. For um, gentlemen, your brain is fully developed typically by your late twenties and um, Women, your brains are fully developed in your early 20s. There is a distinct difference in that developmental endpoint for men and women. And like Marcia said earlier about something else, we're not always sure why some of these things are, but they are. And so they've noticed that development has a little bit different trajectory. The truth is your brain stops developing your um, formally developing because you can learn things for your entire life. But um, the actual brain connections and development um, ends when everything else in your body stops growing too. And so you, what, your long bones continue to grow into your 20s. And, um, and your, your neural pathways get a myelinated sheath around them and they finish around that same time too. So there's a lot of stuff going on in there. So you have your brain, it's dependent on your experience as to how it grows and you learn things. And um, unfortunately, there is a significant number of people who have early trauma. And so let's look at SAMHSA's version or three E's of trauma to try to understand this whole concept of trauma a little bit more. Individual trauma results from an event or a series of events or a set of circumstances that is experienced by the person as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. So you have an experience of your events, okay? The event does happen. That's something that happens outside of you, and it's how you take it in and how you experience it. And a lot of times we experience things that are threatening or dangerous as emotionally harmful or life-threatening. So that's a part of it being a trauma experience is that we have to have this kind of threat experience or it's not really a trauma, okay? If you don't recognize it as such. And this is why some people interpret some things as traumatizing and other people who might be more used to something like that don't experience it or label it as a trauma. Then, on top of all of those things, the third E is effects. So you have a bad, you have a, an event happen to you that feels stressful. You perceive it as threatening and it affects all sorts of things long-term. You can have short-term uh, effects like being upset about something, but as time goes by, you can have adverse physical, social, emotional, cognitive, and even spiritual consequences. This framework for understanding trauma was developed by a working group of researchers, practitioners, trauma survivors, and family members. It was convened by SAMHSA, which is like um, the federal level of OMAS, Ohio Mental Health and Addiction Services. Um, but SAMHSA stands for um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And so you'll hear that word again and again, but that, that's what that means at the federal level. They put this work group together and created this framework so that we could understand the complex nature of trauma, that it's not as simple as something happening. It has to have these three E components, an event, an experience, and effects. When and how did we come to be aware of trauma? It was really the ACE study. Prior to the ACE study, um, and that would have been in the 90s, prior to the ACE study, if you Googled trauma, uh, you would come up with a lot of physical trauma, people um, getting their arm ripped off in an agricultural accident, or um, but it all had to do with medical trauma to the body. And um, once the adverse childhood experience study came out, 
we expanded tremendously our version of trauma and our definition of trauma. The ACE study was the largest scientific research study of its kind. It happened in the early 90s when they were collecting all of the data and it analyzed the relationship between these categories of trauma and the long-term health and behavioral outcomes later in life. What happens to people who have a bunch of childhood trauma? One of the biggest, oh, so by the way, let me mention this. When they say childhood trauma, they, uh, their original survey said from the time you were born until you turned 18. Because we have, of course, that 18-year-olds are arbitrarily become adults in our, um, in our society. And, uh, but I hope you heard me earlier, your brain is not actually fully developed at 18. As a matter of fact, it has some major restructuring and um, lots of things get filtered out and you continue to grow and learn uh, with your brain all the way through into your 20s. So uh, one of the biggest eye openers from the ACE study was the fact that they included household dysfunction. Prior to that, we really only thought about abuse and neglect and what happened directly to the child, not necessarily the experiences of their household or their family. And when we began understanding that all of these things that happen in our context, in our home, in our household, or in our family, affects us in the same way, frankly, as physical, emotional, sexual, abuse or physical and emotional neglect. So just the fact that you had somebody in your house who had their own mental illness issues, that becomes a marker or it counts as a category of trauma. And so does having someone in your household incarcerated. So does having domestic violence in your home because that's really what they were talking about when they said mother treated violently. They just had those old 80 ideas from the 80s where only women or mothers got uh, abused with domestic violence, but we now understand that domestic violence can flow in any direction. Um, but I don't want you, um, I don't want to deceive you and act like it's even Stephen across the board. You are still more likely um, to, domestic violence is more likely to be perpetrated by men than by women, by a vast majority, about four to one. Um, however, we do have to acknowledge that it can go the other way. And there are significant amounts of reports these days, the biggest rising population of domestic violence is violence against the elderly. So people who live in homes with other people who are mistreating them or taking advantage of them, those sorts of things. So this um, one, this one picture here on the slide about mother treated violently should really, you should think about that, about domestic violence in the home across the board. Substance abuse, people who are using uh, drugs. Um, and of course, in Ohio, we have really struggled to deal appropriately with the opioid epidemic over the last decade. And that would fall into that category. And finally, down at the bottom, it says divorce. Again, I'm going to rework that just a little bit for you right now. What they were really thinking about and aiming towards was the loss of a parental figure or a caretaker. And so the easiest way to say that with this population was, did your parents get divorced? Did you lose a parent because they moved out and they were divorced? But we understand um, working with all sorts of people and all levels of society that you can lose a caretaker um, through separation, through the fact that maybe they were never married and then you don't have contact with them. You could even lose a caretaker for extended periods of time due to um, military service or placement in a job elsewhere in the United States, those sorts of things. So really we're looking at the loss of a caretaker or parental figure there. All of these items that I'm talking to over in the household dysfunction column are not directly about the child's behavior, but the experiences of their family and household reinforcing for all of us that context does matter. Abby, I'd like to jump in here for a second because Excellent. I think it's, it's still a kind of a prejudice in our world that uh, abuse, active abuse, if someone is harmed physically or emotionally or sexually is here, is, is 
worse than neglect. And the research is now showing that neglect really is equally harmful to a child. You might not be hitting them, but if they're ignored and they don't have someone in their household or in their life that's um, caring for them and showing them that they matter, their brains don't develop in the same way that someone who is actively abused don't develop. It's, 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 it, it really is an issue here. It certainly is. And I'm glad you mentioned that, Marcia. And I'll add one more comment on that. And that is um, a lot of times parents will say, I never hit my kid. I don't even yell at my kid. But what they're exposed to are the parents fighting. And that, it turns out, like neglect, is just as bad, if not worse, than direct abuse hearing the screaming and fighting and the discord. And I've definitely worked with families who are like, oh, my kids don't know we fight. We fight in the bedroom. Well, you think they're not hearing that? I, what are you thinking? And, um, but they think it's okay because it's not directed at the kid and that they're protecting their kid from it. But it turns out hearing your parents have some sort of a uh, screaming fight is just, it feels life-threatening. They feel like they're not gonna be okay. And so um, these things that we've pretended or wanted to believe weren't as impactful, turns out they're very impactful. So thanks for bringing that up. So before I bump to the next slide, I wanna go through a couple of things. This was a very privileged population. 62% of them were over 50 already, 77% of them were white and 72% were had attended college. And so this is what we would call a white privileged population, because um, in order to even be in the ACE study, to get the survey uh, and respond to it, you had to be well-employed or a family member of somebody who is well-employed with gold standard insurance. This was a, a collaborative effort between Kaiser Permanente and the Center for D Disease Control back in the early 90s. So because of the level of privilege of those original study participants, remember, well-employed, well-insured, they did not identify all of the most common traumas. They, they just didn't have all of the common traumas in their lives because they had, uh, frankly, enough wealth and resources to buffer themselves from additional trauma. So what do you think might have been missing from the ACE study? I'm going to look back at this slide one more time. And if you look at these categories, what is not on the list that we know are traumatizing events? So we've put a little slide together for you to sort of pull those things together. First of all, school and community violence. Those could easily be their own separate categories, but we'll just keep it as other people being violent or um, having bad intentions toward towards us, towards, um, and I include school because including children. Um, while the ACE study cut it short at 18 years old, and I think it should have been into your late 20s, um, it still is the biggest development time in childhood. And that's why it's adverse childhood experiences and not just adverse experiences, because correct me if I'm wrong, Marcia, but we all have trauma sometimes. We lose people that we love, we get into accidents, those sorts of things. And so, um, so it's not that adults don't have adverse experiences, it's that when you're a child and you have an adverse experience, it rewires your brain. Yeah, and it totally affects the development of the brain. So you may not get certain, certain parts and certain wiring that you'll need going through life. So super important, agreed. It is. So think about school and community violence first as the first missing category, um, assaults or bullying or even virtual bullying. We know that that has had devastating impact on um, more than a handful of kids where they get bullied online, they feel like they just can't cope and will even attempt or succeed at suicide. Well, and Bobby, imagine if you're a child living in a neighborhood where gunshots are heard frequently, and then you go to school and you have an active shooter drill. Can you imagine how much that kid is going to learn and retain from whatever else happens that day? Yeah. It, 
yeah, they're going to be so triggered by having to learn how to avoid uh, the active shooter that it, it'd be really hard to learn your spelling words that day or participate in a reading group without messing up, you know, those sorts of things. Yeah, because one of the things that we're going to learn as we go through this is that when we feel, when we're activated in that um, trauma space, we don't have access to our cortex. So we can't think things through or calm ourselves down very well. The next missing category, disasters and accidents. So I think of this one as um, natural disasters. And we know that these are traumatizing. Hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, tsunamis. Um, here in Ohio, you're, the natural disaster is, is limited a little bit to tornadoes and flooding. Um, but we know about these disasters all over the United States. How about the wildfires out West? How about the um, uh, hurricanes? We're coming on hurricane season now and they're starting to ramp up and they seem to get worse and worse these years. So um, disasters are really uh, threatening, obviously to people and they have to cope with it. And then we have all the man-made accidents um, things like car accidents, house fires, industrial accidents, things like that. And those, of course, are traumatizing. The third category is invasive or prolonged medical procedures. I do find it interesting uh, the number of client households that I have worked in. Um, I didn't think about it as I was sort of growing up in my career but it wasn't that uncommon to have somebody in the house who had chronic medical issues. And, um, and we're gonna learn about how these go hand in hand. When you have a lot of trauma and stress as a child, you end up with these long-term illnesses that sometimes require invasive or prolonged medical procedures. So once again, although childhood cancer exists, that's not exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about somebody in your household who has a chronic medical issue and they have to go through these procedures like chemotherapy, radiation, or kidney dialysis. Things that are cumbersome and painful and make you feel bad and look bad. And, and, um, but I'm talking about its impact on the kids. And to see your grownups have to go through that feels threatening. First of all, I'm really scared and worried as that child because is my person gonna make it? Are they gonna live through these horrible procedures? And secondly, I have to think, oh, am I gonna get that when I grow up? Because we're related. And so there's this double whammy there with these um, medical conditions and procedures. The next one on the list is discrimination and oppression. Um, we know now that historical trauma and cultural trauma is a thing, it exists, and it needs to be counted as a category just like all the rest of the categories. Just because it's not a single event doesn't mean that it doesn't have that negative impact as you're growing up. And um, many, many people suffer from some version of discrimination and oppression, including, of course, some classic cultural populations like the indigenous people in the United States, the Jewish people who suffered through the Holocaust and the African people who suffered through being captured and enslaved for the United States and other countries. And so um, these are really long-term detrimental impacts there. And the World Health Organization has recently, not so recently now, back in 2020, announced that they recognize that discrimination and oppression and trauma are all likely to negatively impact our health. And then the last one, I save it for last, but it's the biggest one, is poverty. Poverty is the biggest one because not only do you have that, that chronic stress of, am I, do I have enough money to pay my rent or buy groceries or take care of my kids or do whatever it is I have to do, but in, in addition to that chronic stress of just not feeling like you have enough ever, and you have food insecurities and thing insecurities that you can't afford to keep up with, you also have the fact that money buffers us from additional traumas. So if somebody who is in poverty 
their place gets swept away in a flood, they are, they're up a creek with no paddle for real. And they have to um, figure out how am I going to, how am I going to keep my kids safe? How, where am I going to go? What can I do? And they have no money to help them. If my house were to get washed away with the flood, I have insurance. I have extended family who's also not in poverty. I, and there's just lots of options there because I have money that I can use to offset some of that. And, um, but people who are at the poverty line, near the poverty line, and certainly below the poverty line can't buffer all the traumas that come their way. So all of those 15 categories now of trauma. So the ACE study gave us 10, and these are five more categories of trauma. So when we think about working uh, with people, we can think about how many trauma experiences or how many traumas do they have in their life? You really have to think about instead of zero to 10, zero to 15. And what are those scores like of the clients that you're working with? Those 15, oh, yeah. yeah. I want to interrupt one more time. Just hearing you name all this, I I can feel in my body a little sense of overwhelm. Okay. I'm guessing that's true for others. So I wonder if we just, as you you know, have suggested early, just take one moment to take a deep breath because it's what you said is a lot, and we are those people, and we know those people, and we work with those people. So, it's so true, it's so true, and honestly, that's why we're here, right? Yeah. We want to make sure that you're aware of how being aware of trauma affects you because we need you. We need you to serve yeah. those people and we want to help you be the best you can be. And so you got to take some of this in, but Marsh is right. It can be super overwhelming. And so let's take a minute and I want to describe one more time that deep breath process, because I think a lot of us think, oh, deep breath. <gasps> And that's not a deep breath, that's like a gasp. And what you really wanna do is take in a nice, deep, full breath all the way down into your belly. If you can think about putting that breath or drawing that breath all the way down below your belly button, you're in the right area. <laughs> down low. And then a long, slow exhale. And frankly, if I'm really stressed, the best way for me to do that is to do it as if I'm blowing out through a straw. It helps me to lengthen that exhale. Very good. Two or three of those nice deep breaths with the long exhale should trigger your body to relax a little bit and be okay with the fact that we're talking a lot about trauma. It's and that we don't solve it. Yeah. And that we don't need to like keep going. Like I'm perfectly capable of continuing on even when I interrupted us and to have these few moments to just settle is going to make it so that I can hear you better as you go forward. We don't have to wait until we're a thousand percent desperate. Thanks, Marcia. You could interrupt anytime. All right, so now we had those 15 different categories of trauma that we had to get through. And I just want you to understand, uh, sort of on the clinical end of things, that um, they fall into three types of trauma when we think about trauma. The first type is acute trauma. That's those events. So it is like a bad storm or um, a single event of somebody um, hurting you or hitting you. Um, and you can have a lot of them, but they're still events. They aren't the ongoing, which I'm going to point out next is chronic trauma. Um, chronic tra trauma, by the way, is the same thing as um, chronic traumatic stress or just traumatic stress. That's what we're talking about. Something that's ongoing, unrelenting, it's just repeated and prolonged exposure. A child who lives in a home where there's active child abuse is under chronic traumatic stress because they're not sure when it's gonna happen or who's gonna harm them next or um, when it's gonna be okay and people will be nice to them because it's just this chronicity of feeling like I can't get away from it. And then the third type is complex trauma which you can think about as both types, some acute, some chronic, but they're overlapping. 
and they intersect with each other. There's varied and multiple events and lots of exposure. And then finally, I can't go any further without saying we are all experiencing chronic traumatic stress because of the pandemic. Um, that is a, a, just a textbook definition of chronic traumatic stress. You can't get out from under it. I don't even care what you believe about it. It's changed our world and how we interact with the world and each other. And so it's this chronic stress uh, that changes what you have to pay attention to and um, how you feel about things. All trauma, all the types of trauma include emotional, behavioral, and neurobiological responses. Immediately after acute trauma, shock and denial are very typical. Something bad happens and you go into shock. It like that helps protect you from some of the after effects of that trauma. Longer term reactions include having unpredictable emotions, flashing back to the event, strained relationships, and even physical symptoms like headaches and nauseousness. So trauma impacts everybody. We're all in that now. Even if you feel like I had no childhood adverse experiences, now you're living in a pandemic and it has caused some feelings and some responses in you because it has done so for everybody. Um, so let's take a walk through how trauma, how do we get triggers and how does trauma impact us? So first of all, there's this magic number and it's four. And if you have four or more categories, and remember we now have 15 categories, okay? If you have four or more traumas in those categories, across those different categories, then um, you are particular, particularly susceptible to disrupted neurodevelopment. Now remember, four or more categories before your um, your 30 at least, causes your brain and your nervous system to develop differently in very systematic ways, not just random kind of crazy development, but absolutely very consistently. And what it really does is it makes you be in your stress response system more quickly because your brain is afraid more traumas uh, are constantly coming at you, okay? So four or more categories disrupts your neurodevelopment in your childhood or in your brain development phase, which could be all the way through your 20s. So an interesting thing that happens is that when you're being traumatized, when you are actively in the tornado or um, uh, being abused, okay, what fires together, wires together, okay? So let's say, I'm going to go ahead and use a, a story from my clinical background. I was working with a young uh, boy and he had experienced this trauma, which I'll explain to you. So trigger warning, this is a bad trauma. When he was about five years old, he and his mom were in their little kitchen. They were in an apartment. They were in their kitchen and they were getting ready for, um, uh, to watch a show together in the evening. And they were making some popcorn in the microwave and trying to figure out which show that they were going to watch when mom's boyfriend kicks in the back door, storms into the kitchen and proceeds to beat her unconscious in front of him as he scrambled under the kitchen table and cowered in the corner. Now, lucky for him and everyone involved, the guy did not go after the boy, but he did injure that mom and she was knocked unconscious. When he finished his damaging uh, interlude there, he took her purse and left. And our boy crawled out from underneath the table and tried to rouse his mom, but of course couldn't because she was unconscious. And he was able to use the phone and call 911 and help came. The good news is the mom eventually recovered. The bad news is he had more trauma yet to come that night because there was nobody to take care of him. And so his mom had to go to the hospital and he ended up going temporarily into foster care. So trauma upon trauma that night, right? Loss of a caretaker, witnessing the violence, going to strange new places, that sort of thing. 
what fires together wires together. That young man eventually came to a day treatment program where I was working and um, he did pretty well. I had a decent relationship with him. His mom participated in family therapy with us, but he was really struggling in um, public school and was having a hard time. It was that idea of not being able to control your emotions very well um, because you're constantly activated, your threat responses activated. Well, what activates your threat response? It's all your triggers. And he was being activated by all sorts of things, a loud noise, like a door banging open. He was also um, really struggling on Fridays and it took us a while to figure out what was going, what was going on there. Uh, like many programs, residential programs or day treatment programs, we like to figure out ways to reward the youth who are working with us when they do a good job and achieve their goals and get their homework turned in and all those things. We have fun Friday at the end of the week where they get the afternoon off to play games or watch a movie or go outside if the weather's nice, that sort of thing. He would do really well in that highly structured program Monday through Thursday. And um, he would attend his sessions and he was talkative with me and he liked his teacher and his peers. And for whatever reason, every Friday morning, he would start to melt down and have a complete bank breakdown to the point where he needed to be escorted out of the room. He was shoving his um, peers. He was swearing at the teacher, just behaviors that were really sort of off the hook for him. And we figured it was some sort of reaction, but we couldn't get a handle on what was happening. We tried changing up his uh, academic assignments in the morning, who he sits by. I, I'd go in early and talk with him before. Um, and no matter what, around 10 30 quarter to 11 he would have this breakdown and it took us uh weeks to figure out that it was the smell of popcorn the staff would be down the hall cooking up big batches of popcorn so they had them for the afternoon movie and he of course was triggered by the smell of popcorn because that's what he and his mom were making when the guy came in and caused that huge trauma in his life so the smell of popcorn wired together with fear and trauma. And whenever he smelled popcorn, and he couldn't tell us this, he wasn't able to say, that smell makes me feel uneasy. You don't have that kind of insight. That smell just gets into your brain and makes you feel like, uh-oh, trauma's coming. And he would totally melt down throughout the course of that morning. So we were able to, once we realized that, but it took a while because they're but not very good at telling you what's causing them to feel bad. We were able to just change the making the popcorn downstairs instead of up on the classroom hallway and um, and not have popcorn in any of the spaces where he was going to be. We could also work with him on trying to detoxify popcorn a little bit, but that that moves on. That's a later story. This is just a story to help you understand that your five senses are on fire when a trauma is happening and everything you see and hear and smell and taste and touch or feel on your skin is going to be wired together with that exact trauma and how horrible you, horrible you felt when it was happening. So it's, it's not just that you have one trigger and it was the trauma itself. It's that you have dozens of triggers because your five senses were pulling in all the data when it was happening. When you have so many triggers, dozens and dozens of triggers, you are likely to overinterpret danger, just like he did. He thought it was dangerous to be in that school during those moments because of that smell made him feel like he was going to be hurt or somebody that he loved was going to be hurt. So he overinterpreted the smell of popcorn as being dangerous and it made him overreact. He couldn't just tell us, I don't feel okay. He started pushing his peers and swearing at the teacher and even flipped his desk over a couple of times. And so when people overinterpret things and overreact because of all the traumas, we generally treat that with punishment because they're behaving aggressively and impulsively and super self-centered. They can't stop and think about how other people are seeing them. And so that's almost an automatic response is that we're like, stop that. You have no reason to behave that way. Nobody's hurting you. Nobody's trying to be mean to you. 
get a grip, or you're going to have a timeout, or we're going to punish you somehow. And it's a very common response. But when we do that, we exacerbate the shame and the punishment itself becomes another trigger because we are not giving them time to recover or process what's going on in their brains. So trauma does impact everybody and we all have triggered responses, even if you don't recognize them, but you can build an inner resource or an inner sanctuary so that when you feel mm, dysregulated or just uneasy, there are ways to pull yourself back to a better place. Marcia? Thanks, Bobby. Um, in listening to you this just this this slide, I'm also wanting everyone to know that what fires together, wires together also works to our benefit. Mm. And so this is part of the theory behind the inner resource exercise that I'm going to give you now. And that is that I'm going to invite you to you know, let something come that represents for you a scene or an image or a memory of a time you were at ease. So just like Bobby was talking about the popcorn, the opposite of that would be when was a time that everything worked for you. Mm -hmm. And we're going to wire that into your nervous system and invite you to keep practicing that because we know that as you keep practicing that experience of security and ease, your uh, brain will rewire itself. You'll have a quicker pathway to it. And um, so let's go. I'm also going to invite you, and this is optional, but I'll tell you about the whole exercise now. I'm going to invite you, if you like, to then wire that experience of ease with something that was a little aggravating for you in the last day or two. So on a scale of one to 10, if 10 is the hardest thing that's ever happened to you and one is a blip on the radar, for this exercise, pick a two or a three, something that's easy for you, but a little annoying. Maybe somebody didn't put their dishes in the sink or you know, put the cap on the toothpaste, something like that. Something that's not life-threatening, but just you know, the usual everyday to day annoying stuff. So get comfortable, maybe scoot yourself around in your seat, maybe take a moment to stretch a little bit and just like ugh, wiggle around for a moment. We'll do some more movement at the end of this session. So you'll get to work out all your kinks there. And if it feels okay to let your eyes softly close, you can do that. That might help you um, with your memory or your imagination, but it's fine to have your eyes open as well. And as you sit here, let something come. Maybe you don't even have to go look at it as I invite this image to come, a time or a place or a person or even a pet, some image or memory of a time when you felt at ease. And if you don't have a memory of that, and some of us don't, some of us maybe have never quite felt at ease in our lives. Maybe you saw something in a movie or you have a sense of imagination and want to create that place for you, for yourself. And as I said, you could have a person, a special person there, or maybe you prefer to be by yourself. Maybe you're out in nature, or maybe you're cuddled, you know, on a couch next to a beloved grandmother. Maybe you don't want people around, but you want your pets on your lap or at your feet. Maybe you're at the beach or in front of a fireplace. And as you build this scenario, and you can have choice about what elements you add or take away as well, take a moment to let your senses also be engaged. So in your in your image or your memory, what are you seeing? What are you smelling? If you're at the beach, it's probably salt air. If you're in front of a fireplace, it's maybe some smoke. Or if you're with your loved one, they probably have that special smell that you're attuned to. 
And so let your sense of smell be filled up. And how about your skin? Are you wrapped up in a warm, cuddly blanket or do you have the sun on your skin? Spray of ocean waves. Let the image become more and more vivid for you. And now take one more moment and just let yourself know that you can make any changes to this memory or to this imagination that would make it even better for you. Maybe you want to add somebody into it who would never have been there, but you want them there for this, for this ease and security. Or maybe you want to add a protector of some kind that maybe is a, an animal or a mythological creature even or a spiritual figure that has meaning for you. So populate your memory or your imagination with just what you want here. And now take a moment to feel your body. When this image is present for you, when you've thought about this time that you felt at ease, what does it feel like in your face and jaw? in your chest, in your belly. You might even, and I, I'm just, as I'm doing this with you, I'm feeling like this huge sigh, like, ah. And if you wanna sigh out loud, you can. And while you steep in this experience, I also wanna acknowledge that for some of you, this might not have been an easy exercise. And so it's fine to just hold the question of, what would I like that would help me feel secure? And begin to just slowly let responses come to you. It might not come all today. And so be gentle and patient with yourself. And so if you are feeling a sense of ease and a sense of almost like a sigh or a smile coming, if you would like to now bring into your awareness the sense of the little bit of aggravation that you felt in the last 24 hours and just you know, have this feeling of ease and remember the top of the toothpaste being you know, off or whatever, whatever that was for you. And you may feel a little stimulated by that and then feel that feeling of ease in your body helping to put that experience in perspective in a way. And then come fully back to this experience of uh, whatever that is for you, the ocean or your grandmother. And just let yourself steep in this for another few moments. And again, for those of you for whom this is a challenging exercise, maybe there's one element that you become aware of today. And maybe for you, thinking about and imagining what a protector would feel like might be a good first step. Or something you saw in a movie or in a magazine. And now if it's helpful for you, you might even, we often ask people to do this in the chat, you might write on a piece of paper a couple of the things that you're noticing that you feel right now. Sometimes that really helps you to acknowledge like, oh, my jaw feels relaxed. I feel a little tingly. It feels good. I feel a sense of softness or relaxation. Bobby, I wonder if there are words that come to you. Peace. Peace. Calm. Yeah. Peace and calm. And so those words could even become shorthand for your, for your memory, let's say, or your imagination. I want to make it clear that you can completely imagine this. 
And Bobby, are you willing to share just a couple elements of your inner resource, your inner sanctuary, so people get a sense of, of that? And I'll share a couple of mine. Yes. Um, when you were started the, started the practice, I immediately went to my swing in the backyard mm. because, frankly, I had a very near experience, and that was just Saturday. It was such a lovely day. The weather was perfect. My family was around me. Everybody was getting along. And so I easily tapped into that and was feeling great about it. But then I have a, a go-to place mm -hmm. in my head. And so without even really thinking about it, I found myself standing on the side of a mountain, feeling the breeze, because I've just, I've listened mm -hmm. to you many times yeah. and that's my place. So yeah. I'm a person who... Uh, I'm away from the people. I think that's why I go to a mountain. <laughs> I'm away from the people for a little bit. And I just, um, I try to be one with nature and I try to smell the air and feel the breeze. And yeah. that, that's a really safe space for me, I guess. Good, good. And she's bringing up, actually, I love these two points, Bobby. One is that there might be something that's really fresh and alive for you in that moment. Feel free to use that. And it is good to have a place or an experience that you keep tapping into. My experience is my grandmother combing my hair outside in the sun when I was little. And, and I loved her so much and I felt her love for me. And that, I think that was the main thing. Like she was loving on me that day. And I get all tingly just talking about it. And then I've added other things to that memory. Like there was a crab apple tree right there. And in my inner resource, it's blooming, which I wasn't blooming for sure, but it was blooming in my inner resource. And I have a big protector bird. My protector is a big like condor. So it's flying around overhead looking for any possible stuff, you know, they could be coming. And so I feel totally safe on all levels. And I have mined that so that the moment I start the inner resource exercise, my nervous system goes, zoop. it's like it drops yeah. right in to that calmness. Yeah, that, that can happen for you all too. So wishing you well and keep practicing this one. It's a great way to go to bed at night too. Agreed. Thanks, Marcia. Sure. All right, back to the science. Not that that's not scientifically backed up, but let me, let me correct myself there because taking care of ourselves, spending some mindful moments has a lot of research behind it. But let's look at the ACE research for a minute. This on your screen now um, is called the ACE Pyramid and it is one iteration of the ACE Pyramid. There are many, okay? And, but this is one of their more, more current ones. In the original ACE pyramids, the adverse childhood experiences were the bottom. Like they just assumed you're gonna be born and you start having these experiences. But now they've tacked in, added to the bottom, the fact that your social conditions and your local context matters. And that's what, that's what we're talking about when they start talking about household dysfunction. It matters who you're with and who you grow up with. And, um, and, it, and that is, those conditions exist prior to your birth. And so they're going to influence you, even though you weren't here to start them. And then on the line below that is generational embodiment. So you have things that are passed on to you through the generations. And a lot of times that includes historical or cultural trauma. And so those things are wired into your body even before you're born. For instance, people from those classic um, populations that I mentioned, Africans, Jews, and um, indigenous peoples, uh, they have stress markers in their DNA that is passed on to their kids, even multiple generations past the original traumas, okay? And so when you're born, uh, you may already have some ACE scores, frankly. But then you are born, and uh, by the way, did you pick who your parents were that you were going to be born to? Oh, no, we don't, do we? It's a crapshoot, folks. We're lucky or not lucky, uh, according to how we're, we're born into certain levels of trauma. And that's really all that it amounts to. We do not get to pick what, how, how we come into this world. So you're born into social conditions with historical issues. And then... 
when you have your own adverse childhood experiences, and many people do, somewhere between 30 and 50% of all people in the United States have that score of four or more. Okay, so there's a lot of people um, who have a significant amount of early childhood trauma. And when you have a significant, significant amount, four or more out of those 15 categories, it disrupts your neural development. <clears throat> and the way it disrupts your neural development is it makes you more reactive, hypervigilant, um, and it changes how quickly we drop into our stress response system. A little bit more on that in, in a few more slides. But when your neurodevelopment is disrupted, you end up with social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. Let's think about that for a minute. If I'm being sexually molested by a relative in third grade, how much do you think I'm paying attention to the academics that I'm involved with in memorizing spelling words and uh, multiplication tables would be coming right about then. And so because I can't focus on those things, I end up with cognitive impairment. I'm not learning the things I'm supposed to learn. And because I'm really hyper reactive to things, I'm gonna have social and emotional difficulties. I'm gonna be impulsive and aggressive sometimes, which is gonna make kids not like me as much or teachers not approve of me and try to modify my behavior. And so I end up with social and emotional and cognitive impairment because I'm suffering from exposure to traumas. It really gives us what I call developmental gaps. And then finally, not finally, but up here higher on the pyramid, because we feel so awful, because we're having all these impairments and we're suffering from the traumas we're exposed to, we adopt risky behaviors. Anybody wanna think about what those risky behaviors might be? Let's think about it. We're gonna do behaviors that make us feel better even just for a few minutes, even if they're not that healthy. So let's take something easy like um, eating a lot of carbs. Carbs make us feel better. Your body and your brain crave salt and fat. Uh, you were designed to crave salt and fat because you needed those things to survive. And sometimes you wouldn't eat for days or weeks at a time when we were nomads running around the earth 20 miles a day trying to find the next meal, okay? But that's, that old wiring doesn't serve us very well now. And now if we sit around and eat a lot of carbs, you know exactly what happens. We all end up gaining 15 to 20 pounds during the pandemic. And um, that's just one example of high-risk behaviors. On the next slide, I'll point out some more, but I bet you recognize them. Because of these high-risk behaviors, we end up with diseases, disabilities, and social problems. When we do these behaviors that aren't good for our health, on top of all the trauma we've experienced, we are gonna end up with these sorts of problems to the degree that if you, have an, if you have an ACE score or you have counted up those four or more, if you have six or more of those 15, you are very likely to die significantly earlier than your peers, your cohort, because of the amount of trauma that you have. People with six or more, 20 years, two decades, they died that much earlier than people without that high of an ACE score. So this is not something that just hurts you a little bit. This is a major life-threatening kind of problem. Now let's go ahead and look at those high-risk behaviors. Right here on the top row of this slide, gives the top, four, top five high-risk behaviors, but there are more. Um, the first one though I wanna draw your attention to is a lack of physical activity. Um, when we have that overwhelming sense of dread and we feel awful about life and ourselves and the traumas, it doesn't make us wanna get up and work out. It just doesn't. As a matter of fact, it makes us want to want to lay around and not do much of anything at all. And the longer you lay around and not do very much at all, the more your body says, don't get up and move at all, okay? And the longer we do that, the less your body feels capable of moving and doing anything. 
a lot of people will say, I can't exercise, Bobby. I, I'm just not good at it. I don't like it. I have all these aches and pains. And I'm going to tell you, you use aches and pains to not exercise. But the truth is not exercising gives you aches and pains. Your body, your muscles, your bones, they're meant to be moving around and doing things. And the less you use them, the rustier and stuck, the more stuck they get. And so you really have to push yourself to do any kind of physical activity. And if you're not aware of how this is impacting you, you may not be doing that at all. In addition, you are probably likely to pick up some of these behaviors, smoking, drinking, using substances. And all of those things serve to either make us feel better for a little bit of time or numb us so we don't feel anything for a little bit of time, okay? And those behaviors, of course, are bad for your health. I don't think there's anybody who would argue that smoking is bad for your health, alcoholism bad for your health, and drug use bad for your health. But you, your brain is compelling you to do those things, to use those substances so that you'll feel better, even if it's super temporary. And then the last one on this list that I really want to draw your attention to, because sometimes we miss it, is high absentee rates are part of the risky health behaviors. If you miss a lot of school or a lot of work, that gets you in trouble down the road. Um, you won't make as much money. You won't get um, rewarded with promotions and things like that. You're gonna miss out on schooling events. And, and if you do enough of that, you'll just drop out. Um, so that is a really big problem. But the deal is you like wake up in the morning and you're like, I don't wanna go. I don't, I don't feel like it. I don't feel good enough to go. So I'm just going to lay on the couch all day and watch Netflix. And your brain really says, yeah, do that, Bob. Do it because you deserve it. You've had a rough go. And um, this will make you feel better. Why don't you have some cookies while you do that? Okay. And, it's, and you can see that if you do that enough days, that's a horrible, you're going to have a horrible outcome. You're not up. You're not doing what you're supposed to do and your body's getting sicker. So then when you behave in all these ways, but before I go on, Marsha, any other behaviors you wanna to toss in? Cause I haven't said anywhere near all of the negative behaviors. You know, for some people shopping is, yep. is one of those too, which is fine if you need groceries, but for people, you know, who overdo that and well, it can- Let's call it what it is. It's compulsive shopping. We're compulsive not shopping. About yeah, gambling, gambling, of course, yeah. is in there too. So yeah, plenty. It's true. And so when you compulsively shop or you go online and shop, have you, has anybody ever gotten in those loops where you're just watching them sell you things online and it seems like such a good deal, you have to do it? Uh, watch out for that because not only are you succumbing to that compulsive thing that your brain's trying to get you to do so you're not thinking about trauma you're thinking about buying you're spending your money you're spending your money on on things that you probably don't need and you don't need to spend money on when you need money for all sorts of other things because you may be at the edge of poverty or even if you're not is that really where you want to spend all your money and usually the answer is no so yeah i have to say we don't often talk about that as one of these risky behaviors, but it is. And then let me toss in a few more risky behaviors, especially for adolescents. Driving fast, taking physical risks, jumping off, you know, bridges and abutments just because it feels, it gives you such a thrill. And how about shoplifting and hijacking cars? So those are protected sex. And, oh, thank you. I, yes, you're right. Of course. You were getting there, I'm sure, but <laughs> I'm not sure that I was. Uh, but that's because there's so many high risk behaviors. They're masked. We think of them in different ways. We don't think of them as a direct reaction to trauma, but they really are. They want your brain wants you to feel a thrill, feel a rush, feel calm and peaceful. And so it gives you all these things that you could do to feel that way for a minute, but they're not healthy ways. And so we have to be careful and we have to look at these behaviors differently because all too often, and one of the reasons I'm spending a few minutes here is we blame people for their addictions. We blame people for these behaviors. And I'm just here to tell you, 
Your brain compels you to do these things. It is really difficult to fight your brain's responses to trauma. But when you don't, these behaviors and others lead to all these physical and mental health issues, which are not good. So let me take you real quickly through the process of what your brain's doing that gets you into this sort of trouble. First of all, this is your brain and how it works. So imagine your brain on the screen here and that this information is coming into your head and you can observe it. And where do we get our information from? In general, we get it from our five senses. You can have a sense of things inside your body, but uh, the vast majority of information from the world comes in from our five senses. And we observe it as it comes in and we get to interpret what it's saying to us, what it means to us. We process that information and evaluate our options. We make a plan and we respond to that, okay? So for instance, if my phone lit up with a message right now, I would observe it. I would interpret that as an interruption. I would process that um, uh, one of my options is to look at it right now. Another option is to wait for the break or wait till we're done with this recording. And then I can make a plan and say, I'm gonna ignore that phone because I thought about it. And my response is, I'm gonna keep lecturing and chatting with Marsha here for all of you. And that works out really great, unless I interpret whatever's coming in as dangerous. And if I have a lot of my own trauma history, I'm gonna, remember, I'm gonna over-interpret dangerousness, okay? So I interpret something as dangerous, and instead of taking the time to process, evaluate, and plan, I'm going to take this shortcut here. The stress response system gets activated because of the danger sign. And I'm going to take this shortcut, which is cool because sometimes you got to get away from the danger really quickly and you just react to it. Okay. So the problem is that we're not taking the time to think about these things because we interpret it as danger and we react, but it's not really a problem. If something was chasing me in the woods, I'd want to recognize it as dangerous and run as quickly as I could. I'm not going to stop and call a meeting. That's, that's, that's why you have a stress response system. It does what it's supposed to do to protect you. Unfortunately, with repeated stress, we overinterpret that danger sign and we constantly just jump over to the stress response system and react to what's going on without really understanding what's actually going on. Think about my little guy in the day treatment program who smelled popcorn, interpreted it as dangerous, and started pushing his peers and swearing at the teacher. That was his reaction to feeling like he was going to be threatened. Okay. So unfortunately for all of us, that express route becomes the only road they use after a while. And when is that? Four or more. When you have that many categories of trauma, this becomes the super highway of reactivity. So let's dig in and see what those stress responses look like. By the way, activated stress response is the same thing as survival skills. When our stress response is activated, we're trying to survive. You could also just call them trauma responses if you wanted to, but they're all the same and they're intended to help us escape or deter perceived threats, or alleviate pain or distress that's caused by that inescapable threat, okay? So survival skills are a good thing. We definitely need them. But here's what they look like. Survival tools or skills often look like aggressive behavior, impulsive behavior, and self-centered behaviors, okay? Those are not things we want in our classrooms, with our colleagues, in the movie theater. I mean, these are not behaviors that we want to see in these places. And a lot of people think that they understand trauma responses, but when we get down to the details of what trauma responses actually look like, we judge them and we want to punish them or we want to escape from them. And um, they're really these automatic responses that people have. And people struggle with wanting to give them negative consequences. So they claim that the behavior they see isn't a trauma response, it's bad behavior, they know better. 
they should do better. So let's think for a minute about some actual behaviors. For instance, impulsivity can look like not waiting your turn, talking over other people, running away, and even buying excessive amounts of toilet paper. Do we all remember those days? That was a trauma response. You saw people fighting over toilet paper and, um, and it was ridiculous because this wasn't a disease or a problem with toilet paper. But think about what kind of trauma response, what they look like upfront and close and personal, okay? Because the behaviors that we see, and as a matter of fact, let me mention one more, chronic irritability. That's that aggression one. It's not just that somebody's trying to hit you, it's that they're cranky and mean, okay? So survival skills are uncomfortable, and uh, especially so on the people trying to work with the people who are surviving. So I want you all to think about survival skills as ways that any reasonable person would act in order to escape that threat or alleviate the pain. And we have to stop punishing trauma responses and survival skills because it's not helping. It's just making those behaviors escalate. So that takes us to the four R's of trauma-informed care. These also come from SAMHSA. And again, if you Google SAMHSA and trauma, you can come up with all sorts of um, information and even some more online trainings. But let me real quickly go through the four R's. When we maintain a trauma-informed care stance, we wanna make sure that we realize the widespread impact of trauma. And you should know by now, because I've said it several times, 30 to 50% of people have four or more. And now that we've added a pandemic on top of it, I'm guessing those numbers have gone up. So tons of people in your world, anywhere you go, have enough trauma that it impacts their responses. And that's the second R. We wanna recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma in people. So not just knock, knock, I think I have some trauma and they come to you and talk about it. That just so rarely happens. <laughs> Instead, you're gonna recognize it through those impulsive, aggressive and self-centered kinds of behaviors. As a matter of fact, here's what I'd like to tell you. If somebody's overreacting to something, I want you to automatically think, ooh, could be a trauma response because it likely is. Then it's your job to respond differently. So instead of punishing them or saying, there's nothing to be scared of, what's wrong with you? You want to say, what's, ha what's happened to you? Why would you interpret it this way? I wanna help you. I want you to be safe. I want you to feel okay. And you have to respond supportively and safely, not with punishment. And that needs to be woven into your policies, procedures, and practices to achieve the last one, which is resist re-traumatization. So I don't think any of you go around threatening to hit people or um, hurt your clients or punish them unrealistically, but I do think that we accidentally re-traumatize people like I did with the popcorn. That was never our intent to disturb that young man or his classroom. And it took us a while to figure it out, but once we figured it out, we changed how we dealt with it. So now one more R, and I'm going to turn it over to Marcia to wrap it up for us, but let's go through this. This would benefit everybody, and we want to give you this little nugget early on in the series. Rest and restore. Taking care of yourself is the single most important thing that you can do. You need to take care of yourself. You need to take your vacation time. You need to take your lunches off. You need to connect with other people. You need to do all the things that help you so that you can actually follow those four R's. And you can be physically and emotionally available to serve the people that you want to be serving. It'll also, by the way, benefit, make you personally more healthy if you can take those breaks and tune in to yourself so that you can be a stronger person. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Marsha for our last 10 to 15 minutes together so that she can give us some more active ways to take care of ourselves. So excited for this part. And 
I also want to say there's one more benefit, and I'm, I know I've read the research on this and I want to locate it, but when you are your most relaxed and at ease, your nervous system is catching. Meaning if you're calm, someone who's agitated, who comes in to work with you, they, i.e. your clients are going to catch your calmness. And that's why every few minutes we give you a practice to do so that you can come back to your calmness so that as Bobby said, you can do the other four hours, the ways of relating to your people. So some of you may want to leave right now. And I'm going to say that this is one of the most important parts of the training. And these movement activities that we're giving you are some of the reasons that we're doing this training all over the state over and over again, because afterwards people find out that they love it. Did you want to add one more thing, Bobby? I wanted to let you know that Bruce Perry has said, nothing calms and regulates somebody else's nervous system as much as your own calm nervous system. Right, right. So, and there's some research that says that that's within 10 feet. Oh. So you want to be the person. Somebody once said to me, oh, Marsha, when I'm at a meeting, I want to come sit by you because you seem to be so calm. So, so my strategy now is to tell everybody that I'm teaching, okay, you be the person that everyone wants to sit next to. All right. So uh, you could do this standing up. I'm going to show you in a chair because a lot of us do live a lot of time in our chair. And I'm going to start by lifting my left arm up. I'm going to mirror you. And just sit down with my butt in the seat and reach up through the whole side. Maybe take in a breath here. Just feel the reach sitting down through the hips and feet and up through the arm. And then sweep the arm back out and down. Just this one side. And then next time you breathe in, sweep the arm out and up again. And feel that length like you're making yourself taller on the left side. And and again, let your hips be heavy, let your feet touch the floor, you're lengthening your waist, your rib cage, and this time even tip over to the other side and feel a side bend here. And breathe into this side for your next breath and breathe out of it. And then next time you inhale, come back up, and as you exhale, come down. Now, that's something pretty simple, but feel the difference between the side you just opened and the other side. I'm guessing the other side feels like it's like this big and you feel kind of like you're like that. So you can change your bodily experience. Let's do the other side now. In one simple stretch, sitting down through, especially the right side of your hips. Now lengthen through the waist, lengthen through ribs, take the shoulder blade up and reach, reach, reach. And if you have shoulder issues or something that makes this hard, you could do any amount. You don't have to go all the way up, but you can if you can. And then exhaling the arm down. Feel for a second, starting to feel pretty good on that side. Lift the other arm out and up, the right arm this time. Hips down, feet down, reach up through the waist, reach up through the ribs, and this time tip over like a teapot. And then keep the right hips down so that you really get this length. You're also opening up your lungs for more breathing. And remember, as you come back down, that we tend to breathe less when we're on Zoom. So now feel this. It's starting to be good, isn't it? Okay, so let's do the right, left side one more time. And this time as you go over, and you can have your arm bent, maybe that's a little shorter um, lever here. Hand up or down, whatever you like, and then roll a little bit forward and a little bit backward and a little bit forward. And so now you're taking a little stretch into the back body as you roll back, a little bit of opening into the chest and then arm up if that works for you and roll out and down. Oh, it's getting good. Right arm up, you can bend the elbow or not, whatever works for you. And then as you go to the side, roll a little bit forward and a little bit backward and a little bit forward and a little bit backward. Ah, oh, and then open up and come down and pause and feel and savor this experience. Let yourself really feel like, for me, it's like, ooh, all these little cells are opening up and tingling and just feels really good. Now, normally during the day, we're leaning forward over our computers. And so I'm gonna turn to the side and shift back a little bit. You can see what's happening here. And I want you to put your hand at the back of your seat 
and feet on the floor and just lift up and back. And this is the opposite of your computer hunch. And then holding on to the seat, just lengthen yourself up as you straighten back. So you're letting your back be long as you come to straight. You could also put your hands under the side of the sheet, the chair, whatever would work, and just open up your chest any amount. And coming back. Ah. This is very important. Now, we're doing 10 minutes here in a row, but you could break these up into one minute stretches throughout your day. I do think there's some benefit to having like a few minutes right in a row. So I'm gonna offer one more thing here, and that is uh, a twist. It's so good for your back to twist. So um, one of the things we didn't mention this morning is that one of the side effects of trauma is often chronic pain, mysterious chronic pain. It doesn't like make sense. Like there's nothing exactly wrong, but you're still in pain. And so take your um, right hand and cross it over your left knee and bring your left hand to the side or the back of your chair, depending on the height of your chair and turn to the left. Let your feet and legs be heavy, connecting with your chair and the floor. Ah, maybe take a breath here and come back. Take your left hand across to the right knee, right hand to the side of the chair and turn to the right. Now, you're, it's fine if your head turns, but see if you can really turn your waist and your chest. And if it works to have an arm over the back of your chair, for me, that gives a little bit more opening. It feels good. <sighs> and as Bobby mentioned, it can be really hard to get up and do physical stuff. So if you're starting with this, if you haven't moved a lot in your life, then pick stuff that feels good. And that's why I'm inviting you to pause and notice, do you like the sensations that are here? Do you feel kind of aliveness? Movement is a kind of rest. Let's do one more twist to each side. I wanna say that again, movement is a kind of rest. Sometimes we're exhausted because we haven't slept, but sometimes we're exhausted because we haven't moved. And then coming back to the other side. And so, a two minute movement break can actually be as good as a nap if that's what you need. And then let's do both arms one more time, reaching two arms out and up, stretching up, stretching up, stretching up. And exhale, coming down. One more moment to pause and feel. Again, if it's helpful for you to write down words, or parts of the body that feel good. Ooh, that felt good to my back. Oh, ooh, my face is tingling again. I feel like I have more breath. Ah, my belly feels relaxed now. I'm not scrunching anymore. So thank you for joining today. We have a few moments of closing and then we'll see you again next time. Thank you, Marcia. I know I feel better. And I just want to make sure everybody has our contact information. You can get to Marcia through me. And there is an email address and even a phone number if you need it. And let us know if you have any questions or comments. You can also let us know if this was helpful to you. We would love to hear that. I have to say, I feel better. The rest of my day is going to go better because I did all this stretching right now. And one other thought that popped into my head as Marcia was leading us through this last exercise was... Um, Sometimes I feel stiff and achy at night when I'm going to bed. And if I stop and do just five minutes of some light stretching, I sleep better. So that's it for today. Be careful out there for all of us, everybody. And we'll see you for part two next time. Bye-bye.